Amen. I want to start off today by asking you a question. Let me start off by asking you, why do you come to church? Why you come to church? You come to praise God and worship God? Praise God and worship God? Fill your soul? For your salvation? To hear the word of God? Okay. How many of you would say that you come to church because you want to have a closer relationship with God? Amen. How many of you would say that you come to church because you want to be taught the word of God? Amen. How many of you want to have a better quality life? Listen here. For you to have a better quality life, you have to know what the Word of God says and you need to start applying it. And that's one of the reasons why we come to church. Of course, the main reason we come to church is because we want to be closer to God. But in the process, we're also going to learn things that can add value to our life. And we're going to be show the areas of our life where we might not be right and where the thief has place to steal from us. Who's the thief? Okay, it's not you. I asked, who's the thief? <laughs> no, you're not the thief. The, th the fact is, Satan, who's called the thief, the thief came to steal, he came to kill, he came to destroy. That is the devil. Now, the thief finds it very easy to steal from people that don't know that he's busy stealing from them. Am I right? And that's most Christians. Because most Christians don't really know the Word of God and they don't apply it very well. So yes, there could be a number of answers, but generally I would say that it is because we want to move closer to God and we want to ensure that we and our families can live a better quality of life. So, today I'm going to look at something that can have a very devastating effect upon your life. Now this might come as a big surprise to you, but... I want to tell you that most people are actually their own worst enemies. Now, before you say to yourself, oh, you, you, you cannot be speaking about me. Maybe you should listen to what I'm going to talk about. And you might just have a rude awakening that you are, in fact, your own worst enemy. Is that your daughter? Oh, she's very cute. I can see she got her looks from her mother. <laughs> Amen. Now, you look very pretty. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, have you ever heard somebody say to another person, ah, you're going to eat those words? Yes. Have you ever said to somebody, ah, you're going to eat those words? Or has somebody ever said to you, ah, you're going to eat those words? Well, you see, when we say that from a secular point of view, we're like, ah, yeah, sure, you know, whatever. But what we must understand today is this is not secular, this is godly. The Word of God is giving us a very, very firm warning. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. And the way you use it will determine what you are going to eat. Because I want to tell you something, the way God structured life the way God put us together means this is going to happen whether you like it or not and what you put out there will at some point in time come back to you and you will have to eat it so it's not just a saying it comes straight from the Word of God and it is actually derived from Proverbs 18 verse 21 it is a godly principle that we will all have to eat our own words the good news is you don't have to eat your wife's words or your husband's or your boss but the bad news is you will have to eat your own words what you eat will also have a great impact on the quality of life that you are going to live. Now, maybe what you should be doing right now is thinking of the quality of life that you have. And you might realize that there are a lot of areas in your life where the quality is missing. Now then you must ask the question, could it have something to do with what I am providing myself to eat? You see, some foods will lead to good health. It will bring strength, endurance. It will fulfill you. It will uplift you. It will bless you. But there are some things in this world that if you put it in your mouth, it will kill you. 
some quickly, some slowly. So the question now becomes, what are you feeding yourself? And then the question also becomes, what is the impact that what you are putting out that later you will have to eat? What is that impact going to have on your life and on the people around you? Proverbs chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. The man speaking here is Solomon. <clears throat> Why is that relevant? Because Solomon is generally perceived to be and believed to be the most wise man, the wisest man that ever walked the planet. Now, when Solomon speaks to you, you need to listen because he is not just speaking. He is giving you the benefit of godly wisdom. Can somebody help me? Where did he get his wisdom from? Solomon gained wisdom by praying and asking God. In fact, God said to him, listen, yeah, I'm very impressed with you. You can have whatever you want. Solomon thought about it a little bit and he said, Lord, what I want is I want wisdom. You are asking me to govern these people and I don't think I have it in me. Grant me the wisdom. And God said to him, wow. You could have asked me for anything, but because you asked for wisdom, not only will I give you infinite wisdom, I'm also going to give you all the other things you did not ask for. Point is, the wisdom that speaks through his lips came directly from God. It is God speaking to us. Proverbs 1 verse 1 to 3 says, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, the king of Israel. Now listen to what he says Yeah, Their purpose, now he's explaining to us why does he give Proverbs. He says their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them to understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live a disciplined and successful life. Look at your neighbor and say, I want that successful life. Listen, if you don't want a successful life, there's something wrong with you. Everybody wants a successful life. You're a mother or a father. Your children, every time you think about them and every time you pray, you should be asking God to bless them with success. But you see, success doesn't come without wisdom. You can have everything needed to be successful. And if you are stupid in your way you apply things, you will have nothing. You still need wisdom. Without wisdom, you go nowhere okay so proverbs were written by solomon so that god can have a way to speak to us to give us wisdom knowledge and insight to have a successful life so solomon explains that he wrote the proverbs to teach godly wisdom to man that we might have a successful life now the question is would you like to have a successful life. I want a successful life. Interestingly, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about what we say. Listen to what I'm saying. This book that deals with wisdom, this book that is written, the book of Proverbs, to give us wisdom, knowledge and insight so that we can live a successful life has an awful lot to say about what we say and how we say it. So what I'm trying to tell you is a successful life can never come if you don't watch what you say. Interestingly, the tongue and how we use it is one of the main themes of the book of Proverbs. You see, Proverbs refers to your mouth, your tongue and your lips over 150 times. Did you hear that? 150 times. I don't think there's anything else in the whole book of Proverbs that is touched that many times. Now, if you want to have a successful life, Solomon is speaking about, then you need to listen and learn to what he has to say about the destructive power of your tongue. James chapter 3 verse 2 says, For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. And we could also control ourselves in every way. What would make you perfect if you could control your tongue? 
You see, a lot of people look perfect until they open their mouth. Reminds me of this joke. Woman goes to the doctor. Doctor does the examination. He sits down, he's writing his prescription. And he says to the lady, ma'am, please stick out your tongue. And he goes and he sits and he writes more and he writes more and he takes out a book and he looks up something and he writes more and the woman's like, oh. And she says, uh, excuse me, doctor. Yes. Um, did you want to examine my tongue? He says, no, I just needed some silence. <laughs> James chapter 3 verse 2. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. And we could also control ourselves in every other way. Do you hear that? Your tongue controls everything in your life. We could control ourselves in every other way. Verse 6 says, Now the tongue is a flame of fire. Do you hear that? The tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness. It corrupts your entire body. It can set your whole world on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Verse 8. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil and full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Now, my friend, I don't care who you are. This is applicable to you. And don't act like it's not because this is how we are. We go to church today. We bless God. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You know, we say all the right stuff. But on the way home, somebody turns in front of you and it's like what comes out of your mouth could peel the paint off the walls. And he says, this is the problem that we have. It's not right. Satan is anything but stupid. I want to teach you something about the devil. The devil is not a moron. He's not an idiot. He's not stupid. In fact, the Bible says about Satan himself, he's perfect in wisdom and he's perfect in beauty. Now, this is the thing that's after you to try and destroy your life. He knows exactly what buttons to push. And you know what? The biggest button that he pushes in most people's lives is right here. Because he can get you to curse your own life. He doesn't even have to do much. If you don't watch your tongue, you curse your children. If you don't have, watch your tongue, you curse your wife. If you don't watch your tongue, you curse yourself. You curse your job. You curse your future. You curse your body. How much help did the devil need there? Nothing. He just primes you. Then he sits back and he's like, oh. Have you seen I, I like, uh, I've seen this thing like when, when things begin to happen, they got this like animation of, looks like a little spring box sitting there with his, with his popcorn and he's like, he's like eating, like, like he's, he's watching what's going to happen next. And I see the devil like that. He gets you started. He gets you to start losing it with your tongue. And then he sits back and he's like, mm, I'd like to see where this ends up. He knows exactly where it's going to end up. It's going to end up in destruction. But who's the cause of that destruction? We are. How does the devil go about destroying people? How does he destroy families? How does he destroy companies? How does he break down churches? I want to tell you something. If we have some loose lips in this church, it's going nowhere. Do you know why a lot of people stop coming to church? Because of what they hear other people say. You see, you want, you, one thing I want to teach you, you've got to be very careful because what you say tomorrow is going to be public knowledge. And when you have bad things to say about people, at some point in time, it's going to come out. It's going to offend people. It's going to hurt people. And it causes separation. How many people today are not talking to each other because of what somebody said about somebody and they thought, oh, they will never find out. It's amazing. It's a very small world and things always have a way of coming out. Just to show you, this is a, like a bit of a joke, but it will help you to understand how you never know what, what comes out of your mouth is going to do next. The woman goes to the butcher. She says to the butcher, I would like a chicken, please. I'm having people over for supper. The butcher goes to the freezer. He sees, oh, I've only got one, 
chicken left. He puts it down, it gets weighed, he says to her, it's two pounds. She says, two pounds will not be enough, I need a bigger one. Now he thinks to himself, hmm, I don't have a bigger one. He puts the chicken back in the freezer, he comes out with the same chicken, he puts it down, he says, oh, this one weighs three pounds. The woman says, great, I'll take both. Do you understand the problem? There's only one chicken. What came out of his mouth has just put him in hot water. That's exactly how it happens. What comes out of your mouth will put you in hot water and sometimes you cannot take it back. Sometimes you in the duang and things are going to be tough. So how does the devil go about destroying people, destroying families, destroying companies, destroying churches? How does he do it? Simple. He finds the most poisonous tongues and primes them and gets them going. And you know, one or two loose tongues can destroy everything. How many of you like comics? Anybody here? There we go. How many of you ever read the Asterix and Oblix comics? I have the whole collection. Now, there was one comic made, it was one of the later comics, it was called Asterix and the Roman Agent. Did any of you read that one? Okay, now in Asterix and the Roman Agent, the, the gist of the story is like this. Julius Caesar is asking the question, what the hell must we do to destroy these Gauls? Because they always seem to thwart every plan that we have. We can't get nowhere with them. And then there's this one general sitting there and he says, hey, I've got the perfect secret weapon here. And he brings this small little oaky, this, this like really devious looking oak. And, and Caesar looks at him, he's like, this thing, what's he going to do? Meanwhile, behind him is two Roman legionaries trying to kill each other because this one said that and that one said that and this one is the one, the oak standing in front is the one that's been talking rubbish. And while they're all talking, Caesar looks at this and he says, Ah, this weapon might actually work. And then they send him there to the Gaulish village. And then what he does is he simply he drops a couple of words here and he drops a couple of words there and suddenly she's suspicious of him and he's upset with him. And in the end, that's exactly what happens. The whole village begins to fight with one another. What was the weapon used? Words. Words. In all the other books, nothing that the Romans brought against them worked. But when words came, it nearly destroyed them. And then eventually, Asterix, who's like the, the hero of the comic books, he takes a step back and he eventually realizes what's going on. That this person is using words to bring division, to bring suspicion, to bring alienation and to cause quarreling and fighting. And then he says, listen, yeah, the way to win this is to use his own weapon against him. And ultimately, the plan of Caesar is destroyed. But you know what? That brings it across so clearly. The devil doesn't need an army to kill an army. With the right words, he can turn an army on itself. We are part of the army of God. But you know what? It is words that cause us to be angry with one another. It's words that bring division. It's words that destroy relationships. Friends turn on each other because of gossip. What is gossip? It's words. You know, unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians that really do love God and really do believe in the kingdom of God and they want to have prosperous lives, but they got nothing because they got loose lips. In the Second World War, they used to have posters everywhere to remind people. And in the factories where they created the bombs and where they built the weapons and all of that, they had these big posters that said, shh. Loose lips sink ships. In other words, be careful what you say and be careful who you speak to because you never know who's going to use what you say today to destroy the plans we have for tomorrow. No matter how you look at it, words are extremely destructive and the way we use words can destroy people, can destroy marriages, can destroy lives, will destroy friendships. A poisonous tongue spreads very quickly and can destroy just about anything. Now let me give you a couple of statistics. The average person speaks about 11 million words in one year. 
I know there's a couple of women sitting there thinking, man, I can do that in about a month. Well, I'm not get, I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> so think about that. 11 million words in a year. Of course, gossips tend to speak a lot more than that. Now, if words are dangerous and words can get you into trouble, 11 million potential problems in your future for the following year. Therefore, you need to know and understand what should not come out of your mouth. Otherwise, you're simply the one that's going to suffer because of what's coming out of your mouth. So if our words contain life, according to the Bible, and if our words contain death, according to God's word, then you better start looking very carefully at what is going to come out of your mouth because there is 11 million reasons why you should be wise in what you say. Is it any wonder that so many people's lives are in ruins? And I, I need you to understand something. I'm not talking here about unbelievers. This sermon is not for the unbeliever. This sermon is for people sitting in church. This sermon is for people that read their Bibles, for people that go to church, for people that pray and have a relationship with God, but they still do not watch what they say. Because sometimes we don't understand what we're doing to those around us and what we do to ourselves. Jesus says that our tongues are full of deadly poison. And Solomon says that you will end up eating your words. You see, there's a lot of people that eat poison every day. What's going to happen to you if you eat poison every day? Well, you're not going to do very well. And the sad thing is that it is their own poison that they are eating. You know, here's another thing about mankind. When we got big problems, we find somebody to blame. Oh, it's, it's my fifth grade teacher. It's my ex-wife. Uh, it's the neighbor. It's my boss. You see, what comes out of your mouth, you can't blame nobody but yourself for. You're the one that spoke it. Nobody else. Poison is going to make you sick. Poison will kill you and normally it kills you slowly. It affects our lives physically. It affects our lives mentally, emotionally and spiritually. If what goes out of your mouth keeps coming back as poison, how prosperous, how blessed is your life really going to be? Not that much. You see, here's what you need to understand today. Words actually matter. Listen to this. Sometimes we think that words are just insignificant, but the Bible teaches the complete opposite. Let me ask you a question. How did God create the heavens and the earth? God said, let there be light. Boom. There was light. God said, let the waters and the earth be separate. Whoosh, something happened. What we don't realize is that there is enormous power in everything that comes out of your mouth because whose image were you created in? Okay, for some of you that's difficult to believe, but you were still created in the image of God. That means the same ability that God has to speak things into being dwells inside of you. Amen? Unfortunately, we don't understand that. And therefore, we corrupt our own lives by what we speak and what we say. Remember that God created the heavens and the earth by simply speaking words. Words can build people up. But the same words can also encourage, they can motivate, they can bless. That's the good part of words. And if that was what most of us were doing, then my sermon today would only be about that. But unfortunately, that's not all we do. Out of the same mouth will also come words that tear down, that hurt, that destroy. And words that end up leaving horrible scars in people. You know, when we were younger, we used to say to somebody, when somebody called us a stupid name, we would say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I'm sorry, but that's not true. How many people are sitting in this congregation today? You're still carrying the wounds of what somebody spoke to you or said to you or said about you. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will damage you much more. 
we need to be very careful what we say. And let me just say something. The worst words come out when you're angry. You have to be careful. When you're angry, what comes out of your mouth? Because you see, here's the thing. You don't get a magic wand that you can go abracadabra and you, you cancel those words. It's not like Microsoft Word where you highlight it and you cut it or you erase it, you know. Once it's out there, it's out there. It's going to do damage and it still has to come back later. Words matter to God. In fact, here's a bit of a surprise. God keeps a record of every word we speak. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 12 verse 36 says, But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. This is scary stuff. I'm going to repeat it. I want you to listen carefully. But I tell you, this is Jesus putting emphasis on his words. He says, I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken for by your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you will stand condemned before God. I agree with you. This is frightening. This is enough to speak to you and to say to you, listen yeah, if you've got nothing to say, zip it. You know, there's a proverb. This, this is part of a series. So next week you're going to hear a bit more of it. And probably the next week after that you're going to hear a bit more of it. Because the tongue is such a big thing, I can't get it into one sermon. But there is a proverb that says, a wise man has something to say, a fool has to say something. That's just the way it is. If you don't really have something to say, it's better to be quiet. Because when you fabricate things to say, you end up putting your foot in it and you pay the price for it later. You know, 11 million words are a lot. And I think the fact is, if the average person were to think more carefully before they speak, we would probably only need about one or two million. A lot of what we say is unnecessary. And when we go off into these unnecessary things, there is always the opportunity to put your foot in it. Careless words. Now the root word that is used here means to speak without knowing the facts. Listen carefully. To speak without knowing the facts. Now we get back to the fool. A wise man has something to say. A fool has to say something. When you're in a conversation and you don't know what people are talking about, but you have to say something, you're probably going to put your foot in it, right? But you're speaking careless words. It's best to be quiet. It's not necessary to say something just for people to know that you're there. They can see that you're there. Being quiet also means you are still being noticed. But we want sometimes for the attention to be upon us. Oh, I have to say something about this. No. When you have nothing to say, rather just be quiet because you can't get into trouble with God for what you didn't say. You're going to get into trouble with God for what you did. For your idle words. A wise man has something to say. A fool has to say something. Never jump to conclusions because God sees it as idle words. One day, the Word of God warns you that you will stand before God and God will hold you to account. Can I tell you where the problem lies? Down here, we speak idle words. Down here, we speak things without knowing and what, what, what. And you know what? A lot of the times, nothing happens and we get used to it. So, we don't guard our mouths. We're like, oh, what's the worst that can happen? It's still coming. That's the problem. And you are going to re be reminded of these events in your life one day when you stand before God. Careless words are also summed up by their name. My words could be hurting you, but I don't care less. 
I don't know if what I'm repeating is actually true, but I don't care less. I know that I'm slandering you by speaking behind your back, but I don't care less. You see, careless words means you couldn't care less. You should be caring. Listen to me. You should be caring. You should care what you say about me. You should care what you say about yourself. You should care how you speak to people because God cares. And the fact that God cares means you better care. By your words, the Bible says, you will be condemned. You and I should never put ourselves in the place that we speak careless words. Words are dangerous. Words can kill. Words can destroy. Words can poison. And words are lethal. Now, to make you think, who can I use as an example? What's your name again, sir? Graham. Graham. If I come up to you and I have one of these old-fashioned bombs, you know, big sticks of dynamite with an old-fashioned clock, going click, 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 red wires, green wires, and all of that, I put it in your, I put it in your lab. How are you going to handle it? Okay, he's just going to give it back. I was waiting for the word carefully. <laughs> You're going to be careful with it because you're not stupid. You can see what it is. This thing can blow up in my face at any point in time. So, yes, if I give you a bomb, you're going to be careful, not careless. What if I tell you there's a bomb between your lips? Be careful, not careless. Because when you least expect it, it can blow up and destroy everything every time you open your lips i want you to hear tick 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 tick, tick. <laughs> oh i better be careful back off david was apparently very familiar with the destructive power of the tongue psalm 140 verse 1 to 3 says rescue me O god from evil men protect me from men of violence who devise evil plans in their hearts, who stir up war every day. They make their tongues as sharp as serpents. The poison of vipers are on their lips. Psalm 140. King David, a man after God's own heart, is speaking. We know that he had a difficult life. We know that he battled a lot. And this gives us some insight into why he had such a difficult life. Apparently, there was a lot of people that liked to talk a lot about him. That liked to make problems for him. <clears throat> Listen to what he says. Rescue me, O Lord, from evil men. He calls them evil men. He says, protect me from men of violence who despise, uh, who devise evil plans in their hearts and stir up war every day. Do you know what creates wars between people? Words. If you drop the right words in any room, you can get people to fight almost instantly. You just have to know what words to use. And this is what David says. He says, I have people around me that is on a daily basis creating a war for me to live in. You know, David might have been speaking about the people in his palace. The people close to him. Because when you go further, you see that he's actually speaking about words. He's speaking about people's tongues. How peaceful is it going to be if you live in a house with a bunch of gossips? How peaceful is it going to be if you live in a house with people that like to stab you in the back? How peaceful will it be if you live in a, in a house full of liars? Oh. Who ate my Kit Kat? It was Tony. <laughs> Tony wasn't even there. Tony didn't even know you had a Kit Kat. But now, what's your name again? Luna. Luna. If Luno doesn't know any better, Tony took it. <laughs> Big fight between the two of them. Why? Because somebody lied. Fact is, it's not difficult for the devil to create a war if he has some loose lips that he can use. They make their tongues as sharp as a serpent's. The poison of vipers is on their lips. So now, unfortunately, 
David is not the only one that battles with this. People all over the world are battling with the same problem. And there are many people today that operate in exactly the same way. I want you to notice that the Bible is showing us that the tongue in its natural state is not sharp. God never intended for your tongue to be used as a weapon of mass destruction. Because he says in Psalm 140 verse 2, they sharpen their tongues. In other words, the tongue, when God put you on this earth, he did not give you a sharp tongue. You have a normal tongue. But if you begin to lend yourself to all the wrong things, slowly but surely you start to sharpen your tongue. And the sharper your tongue gets, the more destruction follows you wherever you go. They sharpen their tongues. <clears throat> now, even though the tongue is not meant to be a weapon, for some people the tongue becomes a weapon. There's a lot of people that don't fight with these. They fight with this. Come on. You know, a lot of people, when you beat them up, they get back up, they go on like nothing happened. But use the right words and they'll stay down. They can't get back up. So even though the tongue is not meant to be a weapon, for some it becomes one. And if it is not checked and if it is not stopped, it will become sharp enough to cut people to pieces. Now here is a very troubling thought. If you allow your tongue to become razor sharp, and if you allow your tongue to be turned into a weapon, how do you now control who gets destroyed by it and who doesn't? Because the thing is, once a tongue has become sharp, every time you use it, it's still sharp. You see, I might like him a lot, but the problem is I now have a sharp tongue. I might not like him a lot, and I would like to use my weapon against him, but when I deal with him, the same sharp tongue is going to come against him. How do you now determine who will get destroyed by your sharp tongue and who won't? The thing is, you have no control. Didn't he ask the question in the book of James, who can control the tongue? Nobody. So what is the solution here? You better not let your tongue become sharp. You better not let your tongue be used as a weapon. Because the more you use your tongue as a weapon, I want you to listen to me. The more you let the enemy use your tongue, the sharper it becomes, the more destruction follows you everywhere. It will no longer be in your control. You see, it is true that we may sometimes need to speak to somebody a bit harshly. It's true that now and then everybody needs a bit of a rebuke to bring us back in line. But it must be done in love. You hear what I'm saying? It must be done in love. If you do it to hurt, if you do it to get some kind of a satisfaction, if you like to cut people off by the knees, by the things you say and the way you speak to them, you are sharpening your tongue and you can no longer speak and communicate in love. You now become prejudiced. You become judgmental. You know, the Bible does say we must first take this big piece of wood out of our own eyes before we focus on the problem, the small little splinter in somebody else's eyes. Problem is when our tongues have become sharp, we don't care. We just cut, 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 cut. And we don't realize, yes, go on. That's so sorry. Yes. A lot of marriages, the abuse is not physical. Well, what she says is very true. What constitutes abuse in a marriage? Is it the fact that somebody gave somebody a hiding? Not always. It's sometimes the fact that somebody has a very sharp tongue. And you know what? It's not always the husband. It can just as well be the wife. Neither the husband nor the wife must ever allow things to get to that place. And I want to say something to you, and I am speaking to you in love today. I'm sharing this with, with you because I want your life to be better. If you know that you have a problem in this area, you need to pray and ask God to remove that dagger from your mouth. Because that's what sits there. It's a dagger. And it cuts people. It cuts and it destroys. God called you to help. God called you to build up. God called you to encourage, not to break down, not to belittle. I, I shared a couple of weeks ago, I was preaching in Bloemfontein once in a church. And a girl came forward. If I say a girl, she was probably in her late 20s. Came forward and she asked for prayer. She battled with asthma. 
severe asthma. The asthma was so bad that she often ended up in hospital. Now, she asked me for prayer. When I prayed for her, an evil spirit manifested in her. You must understand something. When you pray for somebody with asthma and they suddenly immediately have an asthma attack and everything looks like it's going wrong, it's not normal. Something inside of that person is reacting to the prayer. Okay, so I could see this is not normal. I said to her, listen, yeah, okay, I'm going to bind what's happening here and we need to have a conversation. <clears throat> so we did have a conversation. After the service, I met with them and uh, her and her sister and we spoke a bit. And I was trying to see where did this come from? It turned out that when she was younger, she attended sports and her coach was very abusive. Her coach, when she did things wrong, in order, probably it was his demented way of trying to discipline her, would shout at her, you are nothing but an oxygen thief. You are, I found an Afrikaans gesê, jy is a sierstof dief. In other words, you're useless. But the words that he used and the way that he spoke it opened the door in her spirit. A demon attached itself to her lungs because it was spoken over her. You are an oxygen thief. It was a demon. We cast it out. It left her. Guess what? She never had asthma. Her asthma was created in her by another person's abusive words. How many other people are battling with similar things? You know, sometimes when, this is not really what I'm talking about today, but this just led to this conversation. What, when a child does something wrong, there is sometimes this exasperation in the parent that we want to say to them, you are stupid, you are stupid. Well, you must be very careful because the more you proclaim and prophesy stupidity over your child, the more a spirit will come and sit on his head and he will become stupid. I went to pray for a young boy. <clears throat> At that stage he was in, I think if I can remember correctly, he was in grade five, the old standard three something to that effect and he was really really badly and um, i'd actually gone to pray for somebody else and then the mother uh, the mother of the boy that i prayed for said listen yeah there's somebody else that's very close to you please they battling with this boy this boy is failing everything he seems to be a very bright boy but when it comes to mathematics and things like that he's just plain stupid and they can't understand that because when it comes to every other area, he's sharp, he's bright, he's quick. But when it comes to mathematics, he can't, it's like he can't fathom. I said, okay, fine. The mother brought him to me. I spoke to her a little bit. I prayed for the boy. Guess what? Something came out of him. A spirit came out of him. When he was younger, his father used to tell him, he's stupid, he's stupid. Uh, if I, I, God must help me because I'm going very far back in the memory banks here. And if I'm erring, it's not to do it deliberately. I've, I've dealt with so many things. Sometimes they all get merged into one. But if I remember correctly, his father didn't want him. He wasn't planned. And so the father always had this towards this, this child. And the father, many times when he spoke to the child, would be very degrading and very belittling. But the father used to love to call him stupid. Fact of the matter is, when he went to school, he was stupid. But God did not create him stupid. The things that were spoken over him brought about an air of stupidity. Do you know what happened? I prayed for him that day. Something happened. A spirit clearly came out of him. His eyes rolled back and his whole body went funny and then suddenly he just relaxed and it was like something had left him. A week later, the woman that asked me to pray for him phoned me. She said to me, I just want to give you some feedback. The teacher had a, made an appointment to see the boy's mother. They thought he was in trouble again, but he wasn't. It was completely the opposite. 
the teacher could not believe that she was dealing with the same child. He was brilliant. Things that he could never understand before, he now understood. In fact, he understood things that nobody else in the class did. But there was a blockage upon him because of words that were spoken. Should we watch what comes out of our mouth? Oh boy, you should. Because you can destroy somebody's life if you are not careful. Even though the tongue is not meant to be a weapon, for some people, unfortunately, it becomes one. And if it's not checked, it will become sharp enough to cut people to pieces. Now, sorry, I've already gone there. Um, if we do not if we do not watch what we say, if we are not careful, we're going to come to a place where we are going to begin to cut to pieces and poison our friends and our enemies, our family and the people surrounding us. It's no coincidence that God's word compares some people's tongues to serpents, to venomous serpents. Because those tongues are exactly the same. The less you control your tongue, the more you leave your tongue open to be controlled by something else. That something else will become a spirit. It will become a demon. The sharper your tongue becomes, the more power you give Satan to use your tongue to destroy others. Now here's a sad reality for you. A sharp tongue operates in gossip, slander, idle words, anger, lies, negativity, destruction, etc., etc., its effects on people can be devastating, even to the point of destroying somebody's life completely. Now, I want to ask you a question. Who is going to suffer because of this? Well, it's easy to say uh, the person on the receiving end. And yes, you will be right, but that's not where it stops. Because the owner of that tongue is also going to suffer. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. If you use your tongue to bring a lot of destruction, if you do not control your tongue, if your tongue ends up hurting people, they are going to suffer. But I want to tell you something, you will suffer even more. Because... The process of sowing and reaping means what comes back to you is stronger than what you sent out. When you put one little millipip into the ground, it doesn't reproduce with one little millipip. It gives you a whole bush. Okay? It gives a plant. And there can be two, even three, whole big millies on it. How many pips are we talking about now? I read the other day on the internet that there's roughly a thousand pips on a millie. Imagine if I put one word of destruction into his life and a thousand come back to me how blessed can i be you're not going to be blessed you're going to battle you're going to suffer you're going to have problems 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 and it will not stop if your words destroy a marriage if your words destroy a friendship if your words tarnishes somebody's reputation if your words are used to stab somebody in the back, if your words break somebody's spirit down, if it brings about fighting and quarreling, strife and division, bickering, what do you think you're going to reap? All those same things, yet even more. Proverbs 18 verse 20 to 21 says, From the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach is filled with the harvest from his lips, he will be satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. The first part is very important. From the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach will be filled. It just says to you, everything that goes out of your mouth at some point in time will find its way back into you. If I say to her, hello, how are you? You're looking very nice. I hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you. What have I done? I've released fruit into her. Guess what's going to come back? Fruit. Imagine a nice big ripe pawpaw. 
Man, I tell you, ah, oh, so nice. It's going to come back to me. It's going to do something good inside of me. I'm going to feel good. I'm going to have energy. I'm going to have power. My life is going to be good. But if I walk around the corner, hey, what a cow. <laughs> What's going to come? I, I cut that off as illustration. Illustration. I could have added some other things, but I cut it there. What's going to come back to me? How many of, how many of you know... Um, what do you call that thing? Um, a cactus. A cactus. I'm not talking about Mickey Mouse stuff. I'm talking about that stuff that you find in America in the Arizona desert. They stand like that and they go like that and they got thorns that long. That's what I'm going to have to eat for what I said about her there. No, a prickly pear is, is very mild. How blessed am I going to be? I want to tell you something. There's no indigestion like what you get from eating a cactus. Your life will go nowhere. Problems will follow you. You will always have calamity. Things will always go wrong. You will eat hurt. You will eat despair, sadness, pain, suffering, disappointment, tears, heaviness, hopelessness, destruction, etc., etc. Again, the question is, how blessed, how prosperous can your life be if this is what you sow into other people? The biggest curse in most people's lives sits behind their lips. It's called your tongue. If you have an unchecked tongue, if you have loose lips, that's where your problem is. And you know what? Nothing is going to change until you understand the problem and until you begin to ask God to help you to cleanse your mouth. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that some people sharpen their tongues like the, the, the fangs of vipers. If your tongue poisons other people, your tongue will also poison you because you will be made to eat your words. Then you can't come to church and ask for prayer because your life is not good and things are always wrong and there's always problems and you've always got pains in your body. You're sick and you can't understand why. The prayer is not going to change you. Repentance is needed before healing can take place. And repentance means you realize what you're doing is wrong and you realize you have to change. And you truly from your heart begin to cry out to God, Lord, I don't want to have this problem anymore. When it's not necessary for me to say something, I'm going to be quiet. When I don't need to be ugly with somebody, I'm not going to be ugly. In fact, do you remember my sermon from last week? Who can tell me what was it about? Mind your own business. You know, there's no need to get involved in other people's lives. If you focus on your own life, you will find enough problems to deal with there. Leave other people's lives to them. The Bible says, mind your own business. And that comes with your tongue as well. When you hear something about somebody, don't, don't go spread it. If you don't know if it's true. Amen. We're going to be talking about all these things because this is a series. Why am I talking about these things? Because you're coming to church because you want to better your life. I'm not going to help you if I don't tell you the truth. I need to tell you the truth. And I'm not telling you this to hurt you. I'm not telling you this to cut you down. I'm speaking the word of God so that you can repent and so that you can come to that place where, listen to what he said. I'm going to read it again. Solomon. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, the king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them to understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live a disciplined and successful life. I know you want a successful life. In order to be successful, you've got to turn your back on the wrong things. This is to help you. Did God speak to you today? Give the Lord a big hand. For our audience that's watching online, thank you for spending time with us. Today we spoke about the tongue. Today we spoke about its destructive power. And I know that you will not be present while we pray. So if God spoke to you today about your life, and if God spoke to you today about your tongue and the fact that change is needed, 
I'm going to pray a prayer. Please pray along with us. Father God, I come before you today and I acknowledge that many times I have not controlled my tongue. I acknowledge that my tongue has been used many times as an instrument of war. And that's not why it was created. Lord, forgive me and help me to be cleansed of the unrighteousness that I brought upon my life. And Lord, forgive me for the hurt and the pain, for the sadness and the sorrow, for the division and the separation that I might have caused by my idle words, by speaking out of, uh, out of time. Forgive me, Lord, help me and cleanse me. In the name of Jesus, amen.